Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode five of Stump the DP. I'm Jim Pittman, your host. And here with me, as always, is my co-host, Carl Hancock. Say hi, Carl. Hey, guys. Uh, hi. Happy Saturday morning. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here, socializing with us during these uh, unique times when most of us are stuck at home. And uh, we're going to talk about airplanes again today. The uh, uh, Oh, I always like to mention and thanking Carl for joining us. Uh, if you have not yet connected with him on social media, check out his YouTube channel, Fly With The Guys, and the other social media, searching for the same Fly With The Guys. He's got a lot of great content. Uh, in fact, uh, I really love your video. I just saw it yesterday. It came up about uh, uh, making sure that you choose the right CFI and how to work with uh, your flight instructor. A lot of good tips in there. So. Appreciate everything you're doing, Carl. Um, let's go ahead and get into uh, some questions. If you guys have them, go ahead and post in the chat. If you have a question, we'd love to put you on the screen and let you ask it yourself. Um, if you don't have a camera or a microphone, you wanna just type in your question, Carl will read it to us and uh, we'll go from there. So uh, right out of the gate, we got anything coming in? Yeah, Sonia has a question for you and I'm gonna go ahead and unmute her so she can talk. Awesome, thank you. All right. Uh, I was just curious, we got airspace A, B, C, D, E, G, and uh, what happened to airspace F? Ah, what happened to F? Uh, it's been a lot of years since I looked into that. Um, there is an answer, and uh, let's, let's see if we can find it together. The, um, so <laughs> the way I'm remembering it is it has something to do with the international definitions and um, boy, I'm really dating myself now. Let me, uh, let me go ahead and share my screen here so I don't forget. So I'm gonna type in FAA, what happened? <laughs> Just type in your question <laughs> to airspace F. Uh, so dating myself, I started flying in 92, got my private in 93. And I remember, I think it was actually during ground school. I was taking a, a ground school at a community college here in the Phoenix area. And um, I learned the old airspace system first. And then either during class or somewhere between my ground school and taking the FA written is when the new airspace or what we call the alphabet airspace went into effect. And I remember being so ticked off because I just learned it the old way and I had to switch and learn it the new way. And it was really confusing. And, and we went from having names of things to having letters that we had to just memorize. And it took a little while for people like John and Martha King to come up with, you know, B for Bravo for big airplanes or, or C for, uh, what do they use C for? Uh, con not controlled, but uh, communication, I think they think for use for C. You know, those little memory aids that people started coming up with were great. But um, anyway, so um, right here on the Google search, let's see what we've got. Uh, oh, and it, my understanding of it, let's see if my memory is correct. Um, it had something to do with the ICAO or the international uh, airspace that was being used. And what happened back there in 93, it must have been, is that the FAA adopted the international format. But when they did that, for whatever reason, F was not applicable. The Foxtrot airspace was not applicable. So um, why that is, I don't remember. This is just a, a chat group, it looks like. Um, when you search for things on the internet, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's aviation or anything else, but be careful, check the sources, that kind of thing. Um, but here we go, right off the bat, um, airspace uh, does not differ. Basically saying, okay, so this is actually the question. So here's the answers. Uh, the, this person claims ICAO class F airspace is a bit of an odd duck. Uh, USFA is apparently not the only agency that thinks so. Ah, Wikipedia. That's, so Wikipedia is not official, but the nice thing about Wikipedia is depending on the post, it usually gets policed by several different people. That doesn't necessarily make the information accurate, but there's usually good sources. So um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but um, let's just leave it at that answer that it wasn't the FA's choice. The FA was adopting something that was already being used in the rest of the world. And for the uses here in the United States, Fox Trot Airspace just didn't so that's my answer. I'm sticking to it. If you want to dig into it, you can do a search like I just did. And it's, um, 
definitely on the G whiz side of the scale, but that's okay. Like we talked about uh, in the first episode, a little bit of G whiz is okay. It keeps things interesting. So is that good enough for now, Sonia? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, anything else coming in there, Carl? Uh, let's see here. The nice man has a question. Rars, go ahead and unmute. <laughs> Hey, Jim. So my question is about VFR corridors. Uh, what are the VFR weather minimums in these corridors? VFR weather minimums in a corridor. So you're talking about like um, in Los Angeles where they make a tunnel through the Bravo airspace. Is that what you mean? Exactly. Okay. So you guys probably just heard that vibrate. I got my phone on my desk. Sorry. Hold on. Let me... We also have corridors over the Grand Canyon. Um, I believe there's also a corridor going up inside of New York, going down the river. So let's, there's let's lots look of at both of those. So I am still sharing my screen. So let me pull that up. And um, Sky Vector is a good one for looking at charts. If you aren't familiar with that, of course I just typed in Sky and it went there. <laughs> laughing Sky at me. Vector dot com. If uh, you're not familiar with this, uh, great, uh, great tool, especially if you're doing something like a Zoom meeting. And uh, look at that, happened to be right there on Los Angeles. So we'll start with that one. Um, so what he is talking about is, I believe it's just charted, or do you have to go to the other side? Flyways. All right. So it's been a long time since I flew these. Back when I worked with Cessna, I used to do everything IFR, just even if I was just hopping around to airports in Southern California on a beautiful VFR day, it's just so much easier to get around when you're IFR using tower and route control. Um, but for the VFR guys, there are these corridors. So are you familiar with these, Raj? Um, do you live in the area? Or, um, no, I live in Northern California. I'm not very familiar okay. with them. All right, we'll figure it out together because I know that there's instructions for getting through here. And I don't think it's the magenta lines. Maybe there's not a corridor anymore. Am I just not seeing it? Um, so the magenta lines are the transition lines. Right which is like what we have in Phoenix where you still get a class Bravo clearance and you follow the transition. Um, so off the top of my head, the quick answer is that um, if you're in a VFR corridor, it's just normal um, like class echo VFR uh, visibility and cloud clearance requirements because um, we know that the airspace under Bravo is echo and uh, my, uh, let's call it an educated guess, is that uh, being in a tunnel that goes through Bravo is the same as being under Bravo. I think that that makes sense. So just normal VFR um, class echo cloud clearance requirements. And I don't know of any Bravos off the top of my head that go above 10,000 feet. So it would just be the below 10,000 MSL VFR cloud clearance requirements. Um, but I really wanted to find how the tunnel was charted. So going by memory, and again, it's been many years since I even looked at it. Um, I thought that they had a, a corridor that went through Bravo. So let's go to our good friend Google and just type in um, FAA tunnel through Bravo airspace and see what we get. Not turn Bravo. That doesn't look like it. I know calling it a tunnel isn't uh, official, but I was hoping we could find a discussion about it or something. So I um, guess it could just be a flyway. But flyways, so that, a related question, one I do know about, is um, that chart. So if you had the paper chart of the Phoenix, the Los Angeles terminal area chart, it would look like this. And there's information here, oh, maybe this will have part of what we're talking about. Coliseum route. So those are, hold on, let me just read here until receiving. Yeah, so Bravo clearance, Bravo clearance. So all of these require Bravo clearance, like what I'm used to in Phoenix. And then maybe this is the one I'm thinking of. 
special flight rules, altitude. Press must be equipped. I'm just reading here. All right, I think this is the one I'm remembering. So they have a special flight rules under uh, 91.155 that, um, so this is different than normal class Bravo operating restrictions, privileges, all that kind of stuff that people learn about getting a clearance to go into Bravo. And at Los Angeles, they've come up with this special rule. And I think this is what I was remembering from years and years ago. Um, and I don't even remember if I ever did this. Cause like I said, I, after I got my private, I got my instrument right away. And whenever I went to Southern California, it's just easier to fly around nine far, uh, once you're instrument rated. So, um, Notice while well, they're so nothing here says anything about contacting the um, the controllers uh, as opposed to all these other transitions with the magenta lines where you need a class Bravo clearance. So I think if you follow everything listed here, so now that we so it's a special flight rules. Let's just search for that. In fact, let's go to our other friend YouTube. And I bet people have made videos about this. Um, transition. So let's try that. LAX special flight rules transition. Did I spell that right? I did not. Transition. Okay. Uh, flying through Bravo without a clearance. There you go. Um, SoCal flying monkey would be happy to show you a 10 minute video about how to do it. So uh, I'm not gonna spend any more time on it here, but I, I think that's, uh, that's good. Thanks for bringing some memories back. Um, uh, you guys can go check that out on YouTube. So that is a special flight rules. These other ones are about getting a class, class Bravo transition, which is more typical going through a Bravo transition. And then what I was leading up to before I took that little uh, sidetrack is that if you had the paper copy of this chart and you flipped it over, on uh, Sky Vector, it's this other button up here in the top right says Los Angeles Fly. And uh, these are called flyways. And all of these light blue arrows are ways to avoid the Bravo. So it's not showing you where to go to do a transition, but it's actually showing you how to dodge the Bravo. And here in Phoenix, I've never been a big fan of that. In fact, I can go ahead and just show you for, instead of talking about it. Um, here we go. So here in Phoenix, we've got the Phoenix tack looks like this. And we've got what we call the West transition and the East transition going north or south over Sky Harbor. And when you flip it over, we've got a Phoenix fly chart also. And these blue lines show you how to avoid the Bravo. And here in Phoenix, um, I don't know how it works in Los Angeles, but I'll tell you here in Phoenix, um, there's really, it's rare that it's a good idea to do this because of all the class Delta airports that we have, it's much more efficient to just go over Sky Harbor and talk to the controllers. Um, usually the people I see that get excited about this side of the chart are VFR pilots that have some fear about talking to controllers, which is understandable if someone learned to fly out in the Midwest or the middle of Kansas or something, and almost all of their training was at a non-towered airport, and then they just moved to Phoenix and they're starting to fly here, it's a little intimidating. I get that. My suggestion is go find a flight instructor and, or even a, an experienced pilot that's local and go out and practice. Um, Cause once you do it a few times, it's really no big deal. And it's much more efficient here in Phoenix to just fly the transition. Uh, we do it all the time, it's no big deal. The times that I've not been able to fly the transition, there's actually been a couple of check rides that we went on uh, it was an instrument check ride, and it's so ironic here in Phoenix, the way things are, the way ATC is. Uh, here's a little another sidetrack for you. Um, we need VFR conditions to do an instrument check ride and, here in Phoenix, and it just has to do with how they do uh, practice approaches and how things are when we really are IMC. Um, basically, here in Phoenix, if we're IMC, it's either a thunderstorm or there's ice. So it's very rare that we're, we have flyable IMC in Phoenix, Arizona. So um, those, there's been a couple check rides that I've had in the last nine or 10 months that um, the ceilings were low. We had like broken clouds 4,000 feet over the top of Sky Harbor, which most places I know that's severe clear, but uh, when you read the details here about um, 
the transition, it's uh, and Phoenix is around a thousand feet uh, altitude, the uh, elevation of Sky Harbor around 1100 feet. Anyway, the um, transition's either at 4,500 or 5,500 MSL. And in class Bravo, of course, you have to have one mile and be clear of clouds. Well, if those clouds are down close to 4,500 MSL, they will actually close the transition. So there's been a couple times that we left Deer Valley and we go to call up for the transition and they just say, transition's closed. Like, okay, have a nice day. So what I did is uh, as the um, examiner giving the student vectors, usually we're trying to get down here to Stanfield to shoot the ILS. Um, I just kept them at a low altitude and um, went under the Bravo and basically followed these airways around. And then I took care of calling the towers and getting transitions, whatever we needed to do. Um, so there are ways to get around it, but uh, that's very rare here in Phoenix that we need to do that. If someone's um, in the live group right now, if you have any comments about Los Angeles, go ahead and raise your hand or put a comment in chat in the chat box. Uh, I'd love to hear more about how it works in Los Angeles. So. More than you asked about Raj, but uh, did I answer your question? So, just, so you, your answer was basically that this class echo, right? So I was wondering, class echo rules, basically. Yeah, so I, was yeah. Wondering... So that, I, I guess I answered about five questions that you did not ask there, but that's okay. We're, this is just fun to talk. Uh, so right. yes, the, your specific question was um, about the visibility and cloud clearance requirements. Um, without even knowing where to start looking that up, um, because it's not a flyway that you're asking about. You're asking about, right? Um, well, now we know what it's called. Thank you for reminding me what your question was. <laughs> um, so now that we know it is actually it was on the tack. Did it say anything here about visibility or cloud clearance? It's got to be Echo. I mean, if, if, you, if you have Bravo, and we know that under the Bravo shelf is Echo, and then they drill a hole through it, which is effectively what they're doing here with this special flight rules, it's got to be Echo airspace when you're in there. It's certainly not golf. That just would not make sense. Um, so I don't think 91.155 says that. If you Let's go ahead and look real quick. So I'm pretty sure... Uh, that 91155 is the same part of the regulations that they used when they made the Luke uh, special air traffic rule. I might be wrong, but let's let's go see what's there. Um, and Luke is uh, here in Phoenix, uh, west of Deer Valley. We have Luke Air Force Base, and there's a special air traffic rule there. All right, what was it? 91155? Oh, no. Um, eh. Oh no! Wait a minute. I know 91155. That's just. Uh, that's the answer to our question. So the flight, 91.155 is VFR requirements, isn't it? That's why that sounds so familiar. So this is 91.155. So what was it saying? The flight must be conducted under VFR and only when operation may be conducted in compliance with. That's what I was looking at. I was looking it up just generally. And it's, yeah. it seems like in the corridor, you still have to file, follow the clearances, those. So even though it's a, even though we're calling it a tunnel through the Bravo, and I think there are some other Bravos that they actually do cut out the Bravo. Here at Los Angeles, it, they're just calling it special flight rules. So technically it might still just be that you're in Bravo when you're doing the special flight rules. Um, operating, so what, what regs did they follow? Hold on here. Restriction flight altitudes. I don't know. Special. Sonia posted something, uh, a link inside of the chat that looks like it goes over this particular item. Okay, awesome. Let me look at that before I do. Because now I'm, I'm willing to say you stumped me because I really don't know. Uh, <laughs> let's go. So. Here at Luke, just because I brought it up. All right, I apologize. This is what I was thinking of. It's actually 93177. So um, is the one that they used at Luke. Let me just real quick go over and see what part 93 is. Ah, uh, fun times. Uh, part 93. Special air traffic rules. 
if I don't mind you guys seeing me sweat a little bit here, but uh, hopefully anyone who's watching this, this kind of gives you a way to look things up. So um, here on the side of the chart for Phoenix, I've got 93, 177. Like, what the heck is that? So I go to the regs, I go to 93 and 177 operations in special air traffic rules. So this one is specifically a regulation that was written for Luke. So that's cool. Um, and they just put it in that area. So 176 is right before it. What is that? Description of area. Interesting. So they actually wrote a rule just for Luke Air Force Base. And then uh, what you need to do in there is found in regulation. And you can find it here on the chart. They give uh, details about how to do the procedure. So here it is right here. It's most of it. And there's another one. Uh, requirements of 91215 and 131 shall be met. All right, let's look at those real quick. 215 and 131. Interesting. 131 is operations in class Bravo. Oh, they're because they're so close to the Bravo. That's probably just like a disclaimer that they put on here. Like, hey, watch out for the Bravo. So that makes sense. And then 215 is... Transponder. There you go. I should know that one. 91215. Everybody knows that's transponder. Okay. So there you go. So there's, if nothing else, there's an exercise in, in looking up regs and seeing what it's referring to. So uh, where's my chat box? Let's go see what Sonia's got. Control bar, chat. Looks like AOPA, is that the right link? All right. Los Angeles Bravo transition route. And do they talk anything about, so if it's just a normal class Bravo transition, then um, it's normal class Bravo VFR requirements, one mile clear of clouds. So I just searching for Visi. Clear visibility. Nothing came up for that. What about cloud? Nope, nothing on clouds. Uh, good reference though. It looks like a good article about doing normal transitions. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Um, if uh, anyone watching this on YouTube later, if you know of another Bravo that has um, uh, like a, a tunnel, a corridor where you can fly basically between the Bravo or in uh, in the Bravo without actually being in Bravo. I, I swear I've heard of that. I don't know where. I've never flown through something like that. So put it down in the uh, comments below. Um, I'd be interested to see where that's at. So, uh, But for now, it looks like um, the answer to Rar's question, I, I am officially stumped because I don't know. It's either got to be Echo or Bravo. Big difference there. Play it safe. Go with cloud clearance requirements for Echo and you know you'll be okay. Um, if you need to go through that special FAR um, and it is, you know, uh, one mile clear of clouds or, or you need to get close to the clouds, um, you could always ask them on frequency, um, though it is technically not ATC's responsibility to know what your cloud clearance requirements are. Um, but based on what I'm seeing here, um, it looks like that at Los Angeles, at least, it is not a corridor or it's not a tunnel. Uh, you are in Bravo even when you're following those special rules that they made, even though you don't have to talk to ATC. And then we found that video. You can go see uh, SoCal Flying Monkey. <laughs> see, and maybe he talks about cloud clearances in that video. Um, if you guys find the answer, go ahead and put it in the uh, comments below. All right, cool. Let's keep moving. What else we got, Carl? All right. Russ Gill has a question for you. My buddy, Russ. Good morning, Mr. Pittman. How are you? Good morning. So Good. what do you got? <laughs> Um, more of a practical application question rather than uh, stump the DPE looking for advice. Um, so how do you personally keep track or what do you recommend for keeping track of all the dates that you are required to keep track of? Medical, when you need to do your medical, when you need to do your BFR, when you need to get your annual done on your plane, when, you know, 
different oil change times, different, you know, even though uh, I'm not IFR right now, trying to keep my plane up in the IFR qualifications, so all the IFR tests and everything. What do you do to keep track of all those dates? Great question. So um, I guess I can stop sharing that. The, um, I, I'm pretty simple on that stuff. Um, I use Google Calendar. <laughs> so um, I'm not an aircraft owner. Um, there are several more things that are time sensitive uh, events that you want to make sure you keep uh, uh, track of. So if I was an aircraft owner, I would probably make a spreadsheet. I like spreadsheets. Uh, some kind of a table that has each item when it's next due. Um, that's the kind of thing you could easily uh, print it out, highlight the next date or the next tack time that something is due and keep it in the hangar. So every time you go fly, part of your pre-flight is to look at that summary sheet. And when you're doing this for yourself as an aircraft owner, not only can you have uh, you know, all the ADs, um, the annual, um, anything else that's required as a regular inspection for your particular airplane, but you can have your own medical um, flight review, um, even your IFR currency, once you're instrument rated, all of those things could be on the spreadsheet that you just print out, highlight the next one. And every time you go fly, be like, oh, I got three more weeks until this thing hits. And so that would be my recommendation is to actually just do it on paper. Um, when I say I'd use Google Calendar, um, and I'm sure you can do this on Apple Calendar or any of the others as well, but there's something called an all day event where instead of putting a time on something, it just goes at the top of my calendar. So um, I have reminders at the top of my calendar um, every day. <laughs> and uh, if there's something that needs to be done in several months, I'll just go throw it on my calendar. If it's really important, I'll put it on there and then I'll put another one a week before just in case I miss it. Um, and, uh, or if it's something I need to schedule like my medical, that, that kind of thing. And um, really I did that years ago when I first started using Google Calendar and I just made it a repeating event. So my, uh, as a first officer at the airline, um, I need my first class medical renewed every 12 months. And um, so I just have a recurring event on May 1st. May is my, my month. So coming up here in a few weeks, hopefully we get things back to normal with this whole virus so I can stay on schedule and go get my medical. Uh, but I just have a recurring event on May 1st every year that says medical due this month. So I've got all month to get scheduled and get in and get it done. Um, so two different answers there. Maybe both is the, the best answer for some people, but as an aircraft owner, I definitely recommend having something printed that you look at as part of every pre-flight uh, and even post-flight, you know, to have that reminder like, oh, wow, you know, maybe I'm not going to fly for a couple more weeks. I better call my mechanic and, and get this AD scheduled because it's due here, um, you know, in, in a few hours of tack time or whatever it is so you can stay ahead of it. So hope that helps. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. All right, Carl, anything else coming in? Um, Tiffany has joined us. She joined us just before yep. or just after we welcomed everyone who is here. So welcome, Tiffany. Very good. Welcome. Um, also, welcome, John, who just joined. Glad and you guys made it. Happy Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Tiffany wrote her question, so I'm just assuming that she she can't talk to us. Um, I can. If you wanted to get in oh, chat and sure. read that real oh. quick, it's a long one. We can hear. Go ahead, go ahead, Tiffany. Welcome. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I have multiple devices here. So I just bought a partnership in my first plane. My question is, I trained in an Avidine with an Avidine 540. This has a Garmin 430. I'm current. I, can, I feel comfortable flying uh, by instruments. I've been really hesitant to jump into like LA airspace, um, not being as check ride proficient as I was. Like, what do you suggest to people transitioning to new avionics like DME arc ready? Um, I've just been real hesitant. I've been nervous because I'm not as proficient as I was with the Avidine. Well, first of all, congratulations on your first airplane. Thank you. Um, you said it's a, it's a partnership? Or yes. Very cool. And what kind of plane is it? It's a P. PA-28B, which is 235, so like a Dakota, I've got the bigger engine and it guzzles a lot more gas. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. And that's still a four-seater, the Dakota? Or yeah. The okay. um, very cool. So um, I was just quickly doing a search here. So the, the Avidyne 540 is what you've got in the Dakota? 
No, that's what I trained in. So that's what I took my check ride in two years ago. And I just felt I had all the bells and whistles. So this is a very old, it's like one of the first GPSs. It works great. Okay. And, and so just for, since I've got it up here, you said the new one or the, they do call it a Dakota? No, they call it a 235. Just a 235. Okay. It's, it's got pretty much the same specs as the Dakota. Gotcha. Okay. So your, your, your Cherokee 235, like what, what call sign do you use on the radio? I say PA28235 or PA28B and they get a little confused, <laughs> confused sometimes and I'll say Dakota. <laughs> gotcha. So that's, so that's what you would say if they ask for your type, but when you're just making a normal radio call, do you say Cherokee? Yeah. Okay, cool. Because that Cherokee is pretty broad. So for anyone that's not familiar, um, let me just click on a couple images here. Actually, I should have done images. Because they are very similar um, on the surface. And uh, so the 430 is uh, most people have seen this somewhere. Um, and then the Avidine is um, fancy. Is what uh, <laughs> Russ actually has. Who we Love it. From. Yep. <laughs> um, remind me, Russ, which one do you have? Um, you can unmute. Do you have the big one or the little one? <laughs> the 440. It's a smaller one. The tall I'll one? put the 540 in with it. All right. So a lot of the same functionality, um, but they are not the same. It's, and I often get questions about Garmin versus Avidyne. Let me give you my standard answer. It's a lot like Windows versus Macintosh or Apple. <laughs> and um, years ago, like, you know, back in the 80s, there were some big differences depending on what you want to do, even in the 90s, as far as computers go, uh, whether you use Windows or whether you use Mac. Um, Apple. And, uh, but nowadays, they're both very capable. They're both just different hardware, different operating systems that basically do the same thing. But the way you interact with them is different, which is why I like the analogy, the comparison. So uh, Avidyne and Garmin are two different companies. Um, as of today, using these two uh, systems as examples, both the, the Garmin 430 and the Avidyne um, uh, any of the Avidyne models, the 540 or the, I guess the other one's the 440 is the smaller one, um, can do all the same stuff, but the way you interact with it is different. And I can tell you as a flight instructor, I've been trying to learn, I'm, I'm still working on learning the Avidyne. I've come a long way. I've watched a lot of videos. There's certain things that I love about the Avidyne, but being, after growing up on Garmin, it's just some things are just bass backwards <laughs> and it feels, it feels, I feel like a fish out of water. So I, even though you're going the other direction, Tiffany, I, um, I feel your pain. Um, so uh, your specific question was uh, what, how, how do you know when you're ready to go IMC? Was that your Yeah. Question? Would you jump in with an Avidyne into <clears throat> serious uh, IMC, not knowing the Avidyne very well? Yeah. I mean, that's the backwards uh, thing. You, uh, you need, and it doesn't even necessarily have to be a flight instructor, but you need to take a pilot with you who knows it. Um, so that doesn't mean you can't fly a IFR and go out and do stuff in even marginal VFR conditions, but I would not go try and fly an approach down to minimums until you are definitely comfortable with it. Um, the good news is there's some great simulators. Have you, have you played with the iPad simulator? that uh, Garmin provides? Not on the Garmin, on the Avidyne. And I have taken a, a girl, a, a, another person that just got a commercial that knows the Garmin really well. And I've gone down to minimums practice, you know? And so I feel confident, but with her in the other seat, you know, I was like, yeah, it would be great having you if we're going down to LA, you know? <laughs> yeah, so, um, I mean, the good news is if you're talking about going over Southern California, um, depending on where you're going, there's a good chance you're going to be shooting an ILS. Uh -huh. and you're probably just going to be popping through a marine layer. Even if you do an LPV, the, the main thing to look for, I'll just give you some quick advice, is that it actually says LPV. Once uh -huh. you see LPV on the screen, just like the Avidyne, you know that the approach is loaded properly. It's working. It's what we used to call being active. It's not really uh -huh. something we talk about anymore because we used to have to activated an approach to fly it and now we just fly onto it and it becomes active 
uh, most with most of these modern avionics. And um, so as long as it says LPV, you know you've got a good GPS signal, you know WAS is working. Um, and uh, as long as, so do you have a, um, uh, an HSI or a standard CDI? Just a standard CDI. I think being flying out of Camarillo, coming through a marine layer that was like 4,000 feet when I was only supposed to be 2,000 feet and LA Center giving me three or four vectors 600 feet off the, the runway in the real soup, that's just what makes me nervous. Right. I did it with the Avidyne. Right. But... Well, uh, so that last part I was going to say with the reason I asked about the HSR CDI is you probably have a button uh, to change the source. Yes. In the yes. Avidyne, you remember you used to use the knob in the top right to change your source. And now, um, well, actually, well, you've got the CDI button here. So make sure yeah. that that's on the correct source. Is there another button in your airplane? Nope, that? it's ju it's just that. And I know the button, just still a little yeah. nervous. So there's di <laughs> it's different on different installations depending yeah. on what else is hooked to that CDI. So, so yeah, it's, you know, instead of a knob twist you're, like you're used to on the Avidyne, now it's a button push on the Garmin. So no big deal. The, um, uh, so my only other advice would be, or factors to think about would be consider how comfortable you are with the airplane in general and how comfortable you are flying in what we call green needles, which it means you're, you're connected to VORs on the ground or you know the localizer on the ground. So that if, if you are in the situation where you, know, you just can't figure out what button to push, you're comfortable just asking for a vector you know, in an altitude and you can say, forget the GPS, I'm just gonna fly the airplane. As long as you have that to fall back to, you're gonna be safe. Um, you might be a little embarrassed with ATC, but if that's mm -hmm. the worst thing that can happen to you, that's not that big of a deal. Um, and, and so, you know, depending on exactly what the weather is and how comfortable you are with the airplane, you can still go out there and be safe. But the other recommendation I, I was getting at is um, pull up the Garmin simulator. Um, so there's an iPad simulator. There's also, I'm just remembering this, um, I'm gonna type in, well, let's spell correctly, Garmin 430 um, simulator. And one of the great things about this being such a popular piece of avionics is they actually have these simulators that work on a Windows computer. And um, have you seen those yet? No, not that I've loaded, pulled so it up here. Anyone watching this on YouTube has to go search like I just did. Since you're here live, you actually get it in the chat. Um, okay, awesome. I'll send it to everyone. So all I did is search for Garmin 430 simulator. And these are actually EXE files you can download. And I don't remember if I put it on this computer. Uh, might be that one. Mm. Let's see how quick. <laughs> Hopefully this doesn't crash my Zoom. <laughs> I, I know. I used to do this, uh, I had a, a traveling laptop um, that I would use this with clients, and I don't remember if I put it on this computer, but uh, I know I've got the G1000 in here. Yeah. All right, well, um, we'll see what happens. But anyway, it's a desktop simulator that allows you, it's, it's not like a flight simulator where you fly an airplane, but you can um, control altitude, heading, and speed with the Garmin 430 or 530 and actually go shoot the approaches that you want to do in real life before you do them. Oh, uh, nice. Well, I would recommend that. The iPad simulator is good too. Um, I have not played with that one quite as much, but anyway, so a few suggestions there. Hopefully that helps. Yes, I love these, these sessions. I've learned so much already. Well, thank you. Glad you made it and congratulations again uh, on the plane. Where, which airport are you based at? The plane right now is in uh, Auburn, California, Northern California, mm -hmm. Placer County. I live closer to uh, Placerville, so hoping to move it there, but the, you know, some partner issues. <laughs> understand. How many partners do you have? Um, just one technically, but her husband has a big say in it too. He's not a pilot, but he does books. Okay. Very good. Well, uh, hope, hope you're able to keep participating with us and thanks again for the question. Thank you. Um, all right, Carl, what else we got? All right. Sonia has a question. Another one. Take it away, Sonia. Sorry, I'm bugging you here today. So, 
I'm, since I can't take any lessons right now, I'm trying to make some headway by doing the ground school part for IFR. So I'm looking over systems for the pedo static. If the static port is over and you open up the alternate static, um, from what I've been reading, the, you will get then uh, a corresponding change in the indicator, let's say for example for airspeed, uh, because the pressure in the cabin is lower than outside. So is that right? And if so, why would there be lower or why, why would the air density be lower inside the cabin? Great question. All right, you guys seeing my screen there? Yep. So I just did a quick search for pedostatic system on Google, on images, uh, I'm sorry, on Google. Now I'm gonna click on images. And uh, I always like to come over here to tools and then go to size and make it large. So a little, little tip for you there, once you get to Google images, make sure you're getting high resolution. And then, I don't know, all these look pretty good. I'll grab this one. Um, it used to be easy to click on an image and make it full screen, but uh, what I've started doing is just uh, on Windows, I right click and then I go copy image address and just copy that actual address up here so that all I'm looking at is the picture. So little little trick for you there. All right, um, so pedostatic, um, let's just go right to your question and then talk about my observations in real life. <laughs> So the answer to your question is when an airplane is flying and the air, we're talking about a non-pressurized airplane, of course. So even when you have all of the air vents and the windows closed, there's still a certain amount of air that can move in and out of the cockpit, okay? It's not a sealed airplane. Uh, I'm talking about non-pressurized. So um, it has to do with Bernoulli's principle. And when you're the faster you fly, the faster the air goes on the outside of the airplane and fast moving air causes lower pressure, meaning the air inside the cockpit um, compared to the air outside the cockpit is a different pressure. So think of it as the air moving around the outside of the airplane going fast, Bernoulli's principle causes it to be a lower pressure, which is like a sucking force away from the airplane from all angles. So you've got this sucking force outside because of Bernoulli's principle causes the air inside the cockpit to be slightly lower. Does that make sense? Yep, yeah, thanks. All right, so that's the answer to that. And that's the answer that people give me when we talk about this on a check ride. And that is great. That's the textbook answer. I still have not figured out why on some airplanes, when we're flying along, and we pull the alternate static, the instruments go the opposite direction of what we're expecting. <laughs> and I don't know, it's uh, all I can tell you is um, you're not talking about a very big change in pressure, uh, like on the altimeter. Uh, and I, I was also, let's go ahead and talk about how to remember which way they'll go. So the static port is what the instruments are calibrated for. So here we have the altimeter showing we're at 4,000 feet and it's just measuring basically the difference between what is set in the Colesman window and what it's sensing from the static port, okay? So as long as we have the correct altimeter setting, we, we are at 4,000 feet. The scenario is the static port gets iced over, a bug crawls in it, for whatever reason, the static port's blocked. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, and just so you know, a more realistic for a VFR pilot, um, a realistic scenario is the airplane just got washed and the person who washes the airplane puts tape over the static port when they wash it and they forgot to take the little piece of tape off and you missed it on your pre-flight. So maybe the scenario is you just took off and you're all, you, you, you know, you're VFR, you're looking outside, you see yourself climbing, but the altimeter is still showing field elevation. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Uh, that's a great real life scenario. So you pull the alternate static, the instrument springs to life, um, you would also see a slight change in airspeed and you would really see the vertical speed jump up all of a sudden. Uh, it would have been at zero while you're climbing out and then you open the alternate static, which is inside the cockpit and it would jump up. So, okay, everything stabilizes. We're climbing away from the airport. We're using the alternate static. The question is, are the instruments accurate? The answer is no, the instruments are not accurate. 
um, which ones are not accurate. Well, the VSI, once it settles down after a few seconds, should be accurate because it's just measuring the change in pressure. So even though you're using alternate static, the VSA should be fine. It's just measuring whether you're going up or going down. Going with the answer that I already gave about the air inside the cockpit being a slightly lower pressure compared to what's coming in the pitot tube, which is the high pressure, the bigger the difference between the pitot tube and the static source, the bigger or the larger the indication is on the uh, airspeed indicator. So uh, that means that when we have lower pressure, there's a bigger difference between pitot and static. So we would see a slightly higher airspeed than reality when we're using alternate static. That's the textbook answer. The altimeter, we have lower pressure. Well, just ask yourself, where does lower pressure happen? And I always try to take things to the extremes. Does it happen down at sea level or does it happen in outer space? <laughs> One extreme to the other. The lower pressure is closer to outer space. So if we are using alternate static, the instrument is going to think that it's closer to outer space because it's got a slightly lower pressure coming from the cockpit. So if we're indicating 4,000, we actually might be 3,900. And you've gotta be careful when you're doing the written test questions because Sometimes the question is written to say, is the instrument showing you know, higher or lower than you? And sometimes the question says, is the airplane higher or lower than what the instrument says? So you gotta read it really careful. And, and that's why I like to just think about, well, okay, we got static, we got lower. That means the plane's gonna feel like it's higher. So it's gonna tell me that it's higher than I really am. And then just think about the question that you're being asked and, is the answer higher or lower? <laughs> I know there's some of the uh, FA written test questions that get kind of tricky for that reason. So um, again, some airplanes, I encourage all of you go try this out. Um, most uh, Cessnas, there's a little pull knob uh, down usually lower and to the left of the throttle, a little knob you can pull out. And it's just letting the air in right there into the alternate static. Uh, that is the alternate static. On most Pipers, there's a valve back behind the panel right under the yoke. And it's a, um, a little elbow, little metal bar that you turn 90 degrees. Um, and it is good to check those. Um, that is something that should be done as part of every IFR pre-flight is to open the alternate static. Uh, usually people do it while they're taxiing out. And especially on the Cessna ones where you're moving that knob, it's kind of like a little plunger. You can see the instruments flick, which is all you're looking for is that the, the tube is connected basically. So quick lesson there on pitot static. Any, anything else on that, Sonia? Well, Tiffany just has a quick follow-up question. I'll just go ahead and read it. It's like, is it typical for people to tape over that? And is it bad if you don't tape over it? Should we be doing that when so, we're washing? Um, I've seen it done. I don't know how typical it is, but um, I, uh, my understanding is that most professional airplane washers, uh, you know, there's these services that'll come out for a fee and, and that's what they do is they wash airplanes, is that they will tape over all ports, wash the airplane and then untape them all. And I've never had a problem with one being covered up, but it certainly is a probable situation to watch out for. Um, but uh, I don't know, get a, get a hold with a, a local professional airplane washer in your area, see what, see what they say. Uh, okay, just, thanks. just know as a pilot, it's your responsibility to check all those. And, and there, there's a reason that we do before every, as part of every pre-flight. So, good question. One quick question for that. In terms of checking the alternate static source, wouldn't it make more sense to have to check those in the air? Because you wouldn't know whether it goes one way or the other um, if you're, unless you're actually flying and having air So um, that's, there's nothing wrong with doing that. Um, the reason we check it on the ground is basically just making sure that it's working, that that alternate static tube is not blocked. And like I said, as long as you see a, a flick on the uh, usually the VSI, that's a very sensitive instrument. So you'll see a, a twitch on the VSI and the altimeter. Um, then you know that that tube to the alternate static port is, is working. Um, but yeah, next time you're flying VFR, IFR, go ahead and open it up and see how much your instruments change and go ahead and note what direction they go in. And uh, I'd love to hear back from you of uh, uh, whether the altitude went up or down or whether the VSI went up or down. VSI is probably the easiest one to see it in. And that'll tell you whether it thinks it's low pressure or high pressure. Just keep in mind that the actual moving, especially in a Cessna, the actual moving of that port is going to move air through the tube. 
So, so I would say move it very slowly. So you're not like, you know, hitting it like a plunger. Um, and, and that way you can probably get a more effective experiment on that. So cool. We'll do it. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Good questions. All right. We have probably about time for one more question and the nice man has a question Carl. about the check ride. You've just given up on his name, Carl. I have. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's become right. a thing now. It's fun. All right, he is nice. Look at him. He's smiling. He's so excited. Nice. We love Rars. Go ahead. Okay, so it's a it's a, it's a check ride question. And let's say I'm the student, you are the examiner, you ask me a question, I don't know the answer, or I don't know the exact answer. Now what would you like me to say? Would you prefer I say, let me look that up? Or would you prefer I give you a best guess and then I look it up? So would that me giving you a best guess kind of give you negative feelings about my performance? So uh, only if it seems like you're trying to BS me. <laughs> so uh, this is probably a good time to say what I what I should probably say at the beginning of all these, uh, Carl and I came up with this the other day, and that is, let's just assume that everything I say on these sessions is my opinion based on my own experience and the way I think things should be until I show you an official FAA reference, then you know it's an official FAA answer. So um, pretty much everything that I share is, is just from my own experience. So as the DPE, um, my question is not so much does this guy know everything that he needs to know? My question is more, what is he going to do in real life? And that's some of my um, check right advice. Sometimes, especially if, if uh, the applicant is noticeably nervous, I'll take a few extra minutes to kind of give them a pep talk before we start at the beginning and we're just chatting and getting to know each other. And I'll usually give them advice that I give my own clients, which is, I, I know from my own experience doing check rides and being evaluated that when I'm nervous, and I've, I've noticed this with most other people, the common thing is that we start getting this dialogue going through our mind that sounds something like, I wonder what the examiner is thinking. I wonder what the examiner wants me to do. I wonder what the examiner really means by that. <laughs> and we, we start getting all this self-doubt and, and these questions going through our mind. That just makes you more and more nervous. It makes you start second guessing everything you're saying and doing. And it, it usually is a, a death spiral for the check ride. So my advice is something better to go through your head. And this applies both on the ground and in the flight. And that is, what would I do in real life? That, that should be the mantra for your check ride. You know, I, on one of these sessions recently, uh, maybe it was on Carl's live stream on YouTube, I, part of my advice was, you know, that 12 to 24 hours before the check ride, stop studying focus on getting a good night's sleep, have a good breakfast, that kind of stuff. Here's one thing that you can do for that 12 hours before the check ride, other than sleeping. When you are awake, just remind yourself, the mantra is what would I do in real life? Just say that to yourself over and over. And then when you're in the check ride and you're presented with a scenario on the ground or in the air, you know, the examiner set, pulls the power and says, engine failure, simulated engine failure. The first thing that should go through your mind is what would I do in real life? And uh, so back to your question, it depends on the scenario. Is the scenario something that requires you to know it in real life? Or is it something that in real life, you're, it's a pre-flight planning question and you can go look it up. So, you know, there's a wide range there of, of things that that particular examiner evaluator thinks you should know off the top of your head versus things you really have to know in real life. So, and remember the spectrum of gee whiz to practical knowledge. So there's nothing wrong with you asking that examiner exactly what you just asked me. So if I'm the applicant, I'm in the check ride, I get asked something, I'm like, oh man, I think I might know the answer, but so what I would say is something like, you know what? I'm pretty sure I know the answer. Uh, I definitely know to, how to go look it up. Um, if you want, I can give you my best guess, but I don't want you to think I'm trying to BS you. <laughs> it's okay to actually say things like that to the evaluator. The evaluator with you know, DP would probably smile, be like, yeah, give me your best guess. Let's see how close you are. And if they like your answer, they're probably just going to move on 
to the next item. If your answer, if your best guess wasn't so good, then they're probably gonna say, go ahead and show me where you'd look that up. <laughs> and let's, let's dig into that a little more. Um, and that's usually what I do. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that are borderline, like, well, my opinion is that you should know this off the top of your head, but honestly, in a real life scenario, you've got time to look it up. Go ahead and show me you can look it up, you know, and let's, let's take a couple minutes and do that. So I don't know. So does that answer your question? Yeah. 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 Thank cool. you. All right. You're welcome. And, and different examiners are different. You know, I'm just giving this from my perspective. So, you know, talk to them. Those are the kinds of things in the pre-flight discussion or, or uh, the uh, pre-test briefing. Um, feel free to ask them, you know, what okay. their opinion is on that. I've, I've heard stories of some examiners that, that frown upon looking things up. I don't understand that. I don't know how many of those people are still out there doing check rides. Um, you know, lots changed just in the last 10 or 15 years you know, with the okay. way things are being managed. So ask them. And as a, as a last resort thing, is it okay to Google things? Yes, uh, realizing that Google is just the search, search. Right. <laughs> and it's all gonna come down to the reference. So be careful, uh, you know, like earlier we saw Wikipedia. Okay, great content, or oh, it's the word, uh, gathering. It's a great place to gather information, but you still gotta check the sources. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, as long as you, you can find something from the FAA or even AOPA, um, you know, if it's something important, they're going to refer back to where the FAA references, those kinds of things. So, okay. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely wouldn't want to come across saying something like, oh, well, Google says or, or Siri says, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, you know, let's, like, let's get the official reference. <laughs> so. All right. How are we doing, Carl? Oh, I think we're at about an hour. Yep. All right. Good job, everybody. Well, um, thank you for being here live. This was uh, fun as always. And uh, you know, for anyone who's watching the recording, we uh, encourage you to keep an eye on the, the web page. Um, I still haven't set a, a I, I'm, I'm very reluctant to set a regular day and time because I'm kind of enjoying this, not having anything on my schedule thing. I'm catching up on all kinds of projects around the house. Uh, but uh, I try to give you guys at least two or three days notice. So keep an eye on the web page for the schedule. And um, uh, keep studying. Um, I really congratulate those of you that are working on additional certificates or ratings, get through the ground school. Uh, once, uh, once this whole coronavirus thing is, is over and we can get back to flight training, I expect everyone to get 100% on the written test. <laughs> uh, but no, in all seriousness, uh, ha have fun and, and uh, keep smiling and we'll all get through this together. So I'll talk to you guys later, thanks. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Thank you.